It was three o'clock in the night, and the postman ready to set off, in his cap and his coat, with a rusty sword in his hand, was standing near the door, waiting for the driver to finish putting the mailbags into the cart which had just been brought round with three horses. The sleepy postmaster sat at his table, which was like a counter. He was filling up a form and saying, My nephew, the student, wants to go to the station at once, so look here. Let him get into the mail cart and take him with you to the station. Though it is against regulations to take people with the mail, what's one to do? It's better for him to drive with you free than for me to hire horses for him. Ready? They heard a shout from the yard. Well, go on then. God be with you, said the postmaster. Which driver is going? Simeon Glazov. Come, sign the receipt. Postman signed the receipt and went out. At the entrance of the post office there was a dark outline of a cart and three horses. Horses were standing still except that one of the treacherous kept uneasily shifting from one leg to the other and tossing his head, making the bell clank from time to time. The cart with the mailbags looked like a patch of darkness. Two silhouettes were moving lazily beside it. The student with the portmanet in his hand and the driver. The latter was smoking a short pipe. The light of the pipe moved above the darkness, dying away and flaring up again. For an instant it lighted up a bit of a sleeve, then a shaggy moustache and big corporate house, then stern-looking overhanging eyebrows. Postman pressed down the mailbags with his hands, laid his sword on them, and jumped into the cart. Student clambered irresolutely in after him, and accidentally touching him with his elbow, said timidly and politely, I beg your pardon. The pipe went out. Postmaster came out of the post office just as he was, in his waistcoat and slippers. Shrinking from the night dampness and clearing his throat, he walked beside the car and said, Well, Godspeed. Give my love to your mother, Mihaila. Give my love to them all. And you, Ignatiev, mind you don't forget to give the parcel to Bistritsov. Off. The driver took the reins in one hand, blew his nose, and arranging the seat under himself, clicked to the horses. Give them my love, the postmaster repeated. The big bell clanked something to the little bells. The little bells gave a friendly answer. Carts squeaked and moved. The big bell lamented. The little bells laughed. Standing up in his seat, the driver lashed the restless racehorse twice, and the cart rumbled with the hollow sound along the dusty road. The little town was asleep. Houses and trees stood black on each side of the broad street, and not a light was to be seen. Narrow clouds stretched here and there over the star-spangled sky, and where the dawn would soon be coming there was a narrow crescent moon, but neither the stars, of which there were many, nor the half-moon, which looked white, lighted up the night air. It was cold and damp. There was a smell of autumn. The student, who thought that politeness required him to talk affably to a man who had not refused to let him accompany him, began, In summer it would be light at this time, but now there is not even a sign of the dawn. Summer is over. The student looked at the sky and went on, even from the sky one can see that it is autumn. Look to the right. Do you see three stars side by side in a straight line? That is the constellation of Orion, which, in our hemisphere, only becomes visible in September. The postman, thrusting his hands into his sleeves and retreating up to his ears and to his coat collar, didn't stir and didn't glance at the sky. Apparently, the constellation of Orion didn't interest him. He was accustomed to see the stars. Probably he had long grown weary of them. Student paused for a while and then said, It's cold. It's time for the dawn to begin. Do you know what time the sun rises? What? I say, what time does the sun rise now? Between five and six, said the driver. The mail car drove out of the town. Now nothing could be seen on either side of the road but the fences of kitchen gardens and here and there and solitary willow tree. Everything in front of them was shrouded in darkness. Here in the open country the half-moon looked bigger, and the stars shone more brightly. Then came a scent of dampness. Postman shrank further into his collar. Students felt an unpleasant chill first creeping about his feet, then over the mailbags, over his hands and his face. The horses moved more slowly. The bell was mute, as though it were frozen. There was the sound of the splash of water. The stars reflected in the water danced under the horses' feet and round the wheels. But ten minutes later it became so dark that neither the stars nor the moon could be seen. Melkart had entered the forest. Prickly pine branches were continually hitting the student and his cap and spider's web settled on his face. Wheels and hooves knocked again huge roots. 
and the mail cart swayed from side to side, as though it were drunk. Keep it to the road, said the postman angrily. Why do you run up the edge? My face is scratched all over the twigs. Keep more to the right. But at that point there was nearly an accident. The cart suddenly bounded, as though in the throes of a convulsion, began trembling, and with the creek lurched heavily first to the right and then to the left, and at a fearful pace dashed along the forest track. The horses had taken fright at something and bolted. Whoa, whoa, the driver cried in alarm. Oh, you devils! The student, violently shaken, bent forward and tried to fight something to catch hold of so as to keep his balance and save himself from being thrown out. But the little mailbags were slippery, and the driver whose belt the student tried to catch it was himself tossed up and down, and seemed every moment of the point of flying out. Through the rattle of the wheels and the creaking of the cart, they heard a sort fall with a clunk on the ground, then a little later something felt with two heavy sounds behind the mailcart. Woo! the driver cried in a piercing voice, bending backwards. Stop! The student fell on his face and bruised his forehead against the driver's seat, but was at once tossed back again and knocked his spine violently against the back of the cart. I'm falling, was the thought that flashed through his mind. But at that instant the horses dashed out of the forest into the open, turned sharply to the right, and rumbling over the bridge of logs suddenly stopped dead, and the suddenness of this halt flung the student forward again. The driver and the student were both breathless. Postman wasn't in the cart. He had been thrown out. Together with his sword, the student's portemonnaie and one of the mailbags. Stop, you rascal, stop, they heard him shout from the forest. You damned blackguard, he shouted, running up to the cars, and there was a note of pain and fury in his cheerful voice. You anathema plague take you, he roared, dashing up to the driver and shaking his fist at him. What a to-do, Lord have mercy on us, muttered the driver in a conscious stricken voice, setting right something in the harness at the horse's heads. It's all the devil of a trace horse. Cursed filly. It is only a week since she has run in harness. She goes all right, but as soon as we go downhill there is trouble. She wants a touch or two on the nose, then she wouldn't play about like this. Steady, them. While the driver was setting the horses to rights and looking for the portemonnaie, the mail back, and the sword down the road, the postman in a plaintive voice shrill with anger ejaculated oath. After replacing the luggage, the driver, for no reason but ever, left the horses for a hundred paces, grumbled at the restless tray horse and jumped up on the box. When his fright was over, student felt amused and good-humored. It was the first time in his life that he had driven by night in a mail cart, and the shaking he had just been through, the postman's having been thrown out, and the pain in his own back struck him as interesting adventure. He lighted a cigarette and said with a laugh, Why, you know, you might break your neck like that very nearly flew out, and I didn't even notice you had been thrown out. You can fancy what it's like driving in autumn. Postman didn't speak. Have you been going with the post for long? Student asked. Eleven years. Oh, every day? Yes, every day. I take this post and drive back again at once. Why? Making the journey every day. Must have had a good many interesting adventures in eleven years. On bright summer and gloomy autumn nights, or in the winter when a ferocious snowstorm whirled howling around the mail cart, it must have been hard to avoid feeling frightened and uncanny. No doubt more than once the horses had bolted, the mail cart had struck in the mud, they had been attacked by highwaymen, or had lost their way in the blizzard. I can fancy what adventures you must have had in eleven years, said the student. I expect it must be terrible driving. He said this, and expected that the postman would tell him something, but the latter preserved a sullen silence and retreated into his collar. Meanwhile, it began to get light. The sky changed color imperceptibly. It still seemed dark, but by now the horses and the driver and the road could be seen. The crescent moon looked bigger and bigger, and the clouds that stretched below it, shaped like a cannon in a gun carriage, showed a faint yellow on its lower edge. Soon the postman's face was visible. It was wet with dew, gray and rigid as the face of a corpse. An expression of dull, sullen anger was set upon it, and though the postman was still in pain, and still angry with the driver. Thank God it's daylight, said the student, looking at his chilled and angry face. I'm quite frozen. The nights are cold in September, but as soon as the sun rises it isn't cold. Shall we soon reach the station? Postman frowned and made a wry face. How fond are you of talking upon my word, he said. Can't you keep quiet when you're traveling? The student was confused and didn't approach him again all the journey. The morning came on rapidly. The moon turned pale and melted away into the dull gray sky. The cloud turned yellow all over. 
stars grew dim, but the east was still cold looking and the same color as the rest of the sky, so that one could hardly believe the sun was hidden in it. The chill of the morning and the soreness of the postman gradually infected the student. He looked up pathetically at the country around him, waited for the warmth of the sun, and thought of nothing but how dreadful and horrible it must be for the poor trees and the grass to endure the cold nights. The sun was dim, drowsy and cold. The treetops were not gilded by the rays of the rising sun, as usually described. The sunbeams didn't creep over the earth, and there was no sign of joy in the flight of the sleepy birds. The cold remained just the same now that the sun was up as it had been in the night. The student looked drowsily and ill-humoredly at the curtained windows of a mansion by which the mail car drove. Behind those windows, he thought, people were most likely enjoying their soundest morning sleep, not hearing the bells, nor feeling the cold, nor seeing the postman's angry face. And if the bell did wake some young lady, she would turn over on the other side, smile in the fullness of her warmth and comfort, and drawing up her feet and putting her hand under her cheek, would go off to sleep more soundly than ever. The student looked at the pond which glinted near the house and thought of the carp and the pike which find it possible to live in cold water. It's against the regulations to take anyone with the post, postman said unexpectedly. It's not allowed. And since it's not allowed, people have no business to get in. Yes. It makes no difference to me. It's true, only I don't like it and I don't wish it. Why didn't you say so before if you don't like it? The postman made no answer but still had an unfriendly angry expression. When a little later the horses stopped at the entrance of the station, the student thanked him and got out of the car. The mail train had not yet come in. A long goods train stood in the siding. In the tender the engine driver and his assistant, with faces wet with dew, were drinking tea from a dirty tin teapot. The carriages, the platforms, the seats were all wet and cold. Until the train came in, the student stood at the buffet drinking tea, while the postman, with his hand thrust up his sleeves and the same look of anger still on his face, paced up and down the platform in solitude, staring at the ground under his feet. With whom was he angry? Was it with people, with poverty, with the autumn nights? 